I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. So, by the way, I just want to mention quickly, uh, this is Friday. I always put out Side Hustle Fridays. But given all the news, I gave this absolute priority. Side Hustle Fridays will be firmly back. I have a very exciting one for next Friday, which was really intriguing to me and and fascinating. So next week, Side Hustle Fridays. And here we go with Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams and possible next mayor of New York City is on the podcast. And as you can probably imagine, I had a lot of questions to ask him. First off, just to give some credibility to Eric, uh, not that he needs any more credibility from me, but he was also in the police force for 22 years, so has a lot of thoughts about that. When he won the presidency of Brooklyn, he won with 92% of the vote. Brooklyn is, uh, I believe geographically, is the largest borough. And if if all the boroughs were cities, Brooklyn would be the third largest city in the United States after L.A., Chicago. And, uh, you know, it's really important. This is not about what's best for New York. All first tier cities on the entire planet are having similar issues. They're having problems keeping citizens in the city, and that's your tax base, which means if you don't have a tax base, you don't have garbage collectors, you don't have police, you don't have healthcare workers, you don't have teachers, you don't have a lot of things. You don't have infrastructure development, you don't have incentives to to bring businesses here, so you need tax revenues, and all of these cities, they are at the disaster level in terms of their revenues versus skyrocketing deficits. So it was really important for me to bring on Eric, lifelong New Yorker and one of the leaders of New York City and potentially the leader of New York City in a, in a year or so to bring him onto the podcast and ask him what his solutions are, both short term and also what is a long term philosophy now for running a city? How do you start to tackle problems that almost seem un unavoidable like i mean it's very hard to deal with the problems that these cities all of these cities face right now so you need not only immediate solutions or thoughts about them but kind of an ongoing philosophy about how you would run a city differently so that this doesn't happen again by the way i had eric's time for an hour he'll come on again if anybody has further questions after this for him or for other mayoral candidates who i hope to bring on uh, please send them to me. You can text me at 203-590-8607. Happy to ask any question on the next podcast with him or I'll summarize things in an email to him or I'll talk to him and, and get answers. But anyway, enjoy what Eric Adams has to say, not just about New York, but a philosophy for running all cities right now. 
So first off, Eric Adams, Brooklyn Borough President and candidate for mayor, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Real appreciate. Always good seeing you. Yeah, I miss I miss seeing you in person. It's been uh, since the lockdown began. No, no what? And, you know, like all lockdowns, uh, we, we're going to eventually find the key to the door so we can get back to seeing each other. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about that, because New York City, there's, on every single level, I'm just curious what you would do as as mayor. So so, for instance. Right now, the biggest issue or one of the biggest issues, there's many big issues, but indoor dining is not allowed in restaurants in New York City. And from what I hear from my perspective as also a storefront owner in New York City, something like 95% of restaurants are telling me they will go out of business by January 1st if there's no indoor dining. Well, well, I don't think it's so much what I would do as mayor as much as what I would do uh, as the borough president and even as a citizen. I'm going to continue to advocate uh, for the livelihood of New Yorkers, no matter what I'm doing, James. And when you look at what we're doing to our restaurants and our business community in the city, uh, it is almost criminal, in my opinion. Uh, There is no reason we cannot, number one, the outdoor dining should be expanded, particularly on the Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays during the weekend in those areas that is not heavy residential. We, we're telling our restaurant establishments now, you have to have a clear table at 11 p.m. That means you must stop serving by 1030 and have people start leaving. That is just not profitable. And it's not only hurting the businesses owners, uh, but it's also hurting the dishwashers, the busboying girls, right. the waiters. It's destroying the rippling effects is just really impacting us. Second, how do you say you can't have indoor dining? And if you're on the border of Nassau County in Queens, on one side of the street, you're able to have indoor dining. And then across the street, you can't because you're in Queens. We're just really choking of the economics of the city. I think we can open indoor dining at a slow rate. Those who don't do it correctly, we should shut them down, but if they're doing it right, let them continue to prosper. And then look at the numbers. If the numbers inch up to a certain level, then you modify what you're doing, but we have to get this city back operating. Yeah, I agree. Like it's like you said, it's not just restaurant owners who are hurt. It's the 300,000 to half a million employees that the work, the workers who will lose their jobs. It's the tourists who will have no interest in coming to New York city and spending hundreds of millions of dollars. It's the, the tax base. Uh, I think it's, like I said, I think that's a, a serious issue. And like you point out, it seems almost arbitrary because three feet away in Nassau County, they're having fun and laughing at us. Right. Right. And that's Westchester, Yonkers, New Jersey, all of our normal restaurant traffic is being sent to other municipalities. So what if you, like, is this possible? Like, let's say November 1st hits and it's really cold. Restaurants are starting to not know what to do. And the mayor is sticking with the no indoor dining. Can you open up Brooklyn, for instance? Like, is anyone going to shut you down if you say to restaurants in Brooklyn, hey, just go for it? Uh, yes, the the decision lies in uh, two of the executive ch- chambers. One, the governor will say what's going to happen in the state of New York, and the mayor will state what's going to happen in the city of New York. And so all of the five boroughs must follow the same rule, and it's unfortunate that we're not seeing the consistency that we need on the state and the city level, and we're not seeing the partnership. And then, James, think about it. Uh, I was really disappointed to hear the mayor says uh, that basically restaurants are for rich people. That is not true. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know why is this energy is being created where we want to divide our city. You know, people people say this, James. They say the tale of two cities. I want to tell you about the tale of one city. I want to talk about the tale of people in every block, every neighborhood, realizing we're all in this together, and it's about one city. 
And I don't want to divide my high income earners from those who are low income earners because we need each other to get us through this very difficult time. So, so I'm just going to be really, uh, you know, kind of uh, aggressive on these questions, not about you, but because I'm really concerned, obviously, as, as I've seen firsthand these past few weeks, I'm really concerned about these problems and that I don't feel anybody's taking seriously what just one of them being this restaurant issue. But, uh, what, you know, again, I don't think it's constitutional to keep you, you, you can't shut down a business without due process in the, in the constitution. You can't take property or someone's right to earn a living. Like what if restaurant owners sued on a constitutional basis, they're definitely going to win. But the question is, it get, it doesn't get through the courts in time. And there was a lawsuit that was announced the last few days, I believe last week. I spoke with one of the attorneys who's part of the lawsuit. So there is legal action that is trying to make its way through the court. Hopefully we can expedite it and get a ruling right away. We can't state that the city of New York stays shut until a vaccine is found. That is not how you run the balance of the city. There must be a balance between a public health and the need to ensure that we have the economic stimulus that we could move the city forward. And of course, we need help from Washington, D.C. It doesn't appear as though it's going to come. And so we must come up with our own plan. And that is why one of those plans is to balance out our public health and to ensure the economics of the city moves forward. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people obviously are still concerned about the virus and, you know, so there's competing interests. It's not just a matter of keeping the restaurants closed. You also have to message to these people that their health will be protected. I don't really know how you do that, but, but, you know, the other thing is something like 400,000 people left the city in March and have not yet come back. Apartment vacancies are at an all time high. Uh, you know, and some of these 400,000 people will, will add to that list of apartment vacancies. There's 600,000 college students in New York City. The schools have not opened for, you know, on-campus access. They're mostly remote or hybrid remote. So that's going to add to the apartment vacancies, which is going to in turn add to the problems with evictions and then landlord bankruptcies. And we're not even getting to commercial real estate yet. So what do you think about the residential situation? A, a really uh, troubling, and there's, very, there's several different angles to this conversation around the residential issue. Number one, uh, when you look at the 400,000 plus and it continues to climb, number of people who are leaving the city or who have left the city, uh, many of them are high income earners. It, it attacks our tax base. And again, uh, the response by some city officials who are basically saying, uh, so what if they leave, they were rich anyway, that is just not responsible because the high income earners with discretionary funding, they play a major role in our theaters, our tourism, our restaurants, our buying in the different shops, the retail. We can't afford to lose our high income earners uh, because it plays a vital role in our tax base. And so I don't embrace that feeling that so what if they leave? I say, no, don't leave. Uh, stay here. Continue to help us as we dig ourselves out of this financial crisis. And then there are those who are saying, don't pay rent. Uh, people are calling for uh, rent uh, strikes. And that is not responsible uh, because when you think of renters, you're not only talking about landlords who own thousands of apartments, you're talking about those one and two and three family homeowners, the grandmother who uses her renter income uh, to pay her mortgage. If you lose these small uh, three, three family and less homeowners that are renters, you're destroying the middle class in the city and the apartment and our living dwellings is they're part of an overall ecosystem that you cannot remove one piece of it without throwing out of balance the entire rental uh, market on a whole. Yeah, I agree with you. But the, the problem is with the government asking people to stay home and not go to work so that they could make a living to feed their family and pay their rent, 
you have to give them something for that. The stimulus checks have, have run out. Who knows if there's going to be another federal stimulus? Uh, what? How do you solve this problem? This is where government must step in. And let's be clear, we must divide up of the types of people who have been impacted by COVID. Not everyone who has stayed home lost money. There are some people who have been able to work from home. There's some people who have been able to telecommute. If you were not impacted by COVID, you should be still paying your rent. You should be still paying into society. You should be still volunteering and helping people. Those of us who were not impacted negatively financially should be still doing our due diligence to make sure the city continues to run. Then those who have been directly impacted, if the government of government is telling people, stay home, don't work, you can't pay your rent, now it's time for the federal and the state government to kick in because we have to make everyone whole or share some of the pain. You can't tell small property owners that you are not going to get your rent you will lose, they will lose their homes, and now we've created another crisis. That can't happen. We have to support our middle class families. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I also see that the only real solution is some kind of government involvement, which, which I'll get to in, in a little bit, because then the next issue is, of course, you know, commercial real estate, even forgetting the issues I bring up in my article about remote work and, you know, the office buildings haven't been filling up and some of these people might be leaving permanently. Just the fact that all the restaurants, you, you can't replace a, a restaurant so easily if that's your, if that's your main tenant on the first floor, you can't replace a clothing store so easily. And of course, then there's going to be some offices that won't be released. So we're also going to have a crisis for commercial real estate. And, and again, the tax base. Well, no, without a doubt. But, you know, what's interesting, James, is that uh, many of the people who are advocating uh, for that retail space, that commercial space, uh, they're calling for saving the retail. You know how we can save the retail? Uh, free ourselves from the addiction, addiction of Amazon. You know, some of yeah. the same people are saying save retail, but when was the last time they were in a retail? When was the last time uh, they left their homes to go uh, shop locally and patronize a local shop. Uh, some of the strongest advocates uh, won't leave their home and go walk into a store and purchase locally. We need to encourage each other to buy locally and not continue to, to, to feed the multi-billion dollar industry that is really closing down our local stores. But at the same time, I also believe that if we're thinking about bailing out and using money smartly, we need to uh, give that bailout to some of the local businesses, uh, give them uh, a, lease, a lease payment, allow them to be able to sustain themselves throughout this difficult time. And the banks must get involved, James. You can't get over that. The American people bailed out the banking industry when they recklessly uh, did the financial mortgage scandal. Now it's time for our banks to bail out the American people. Yeah, you know, and, and, and that's an interesting question. I mean, every city is saying the same thing. Like what makes this different than a 9-11 is that 9-11 was just New York City and we felt so much love then, not only from the rest of the country, but the rest of the world. But now every city is going through this issue. So it's a little bit difficult. And and I do want to talk about the the more directly the finances in a little bit, but, um, you know, in term, I, I have an idea. I just was thinking of an idea, uh, in terms of getting people to lose the addiction to Amazon and spend locally. What about we create something like, let's just call it New York bucks. So it's like this coupon like currency that can be only spent in New York. And then eventually after a certain date, transferred into dollars or discounts or whatever. So, you know, almost like war bonds, but for, for New York, that the people of New York participate in. I, I, I think that, first of all, I think that every idea should be entertained and look, looked at. I love the concept of encouraging people uh, to purchase locally. And if it means war bucks uh, that will infuse money into our local economy, I am all for it. And what you just said is something that we need. 
We need people who are thinking not outside the box, but who have decided to destroy the box. We have to reinvent ourselves as a city. And it's going to take real creative thinkers to do so. And we have some amazing people in the city of New York. And I want to encourage people to reach out, email, Google, send your ideas to those of us who are in office so that we can think differently of what the city must look like. So, you know, in terms of the finances, uh, you know, we have this situation where de Blasio is close to firing 22,000 city employees. Whether this happens now or later, it, just, it seems almost inevitable given the, the, you know, tax revenues are going down while deficits are going up and we're already in the hole. And he was talking about EMT workers, transit authority workers, police, teachers, garbage collectors. There's garbage all over the streets right now and before there's even people fired as far as I know. So how do you start to save these city employees? And this is just the beginning. So, so true. I, I believe right now we're trying to close a deficit and probably in the out years, we're going to look at another either four to six billion dollars deficit. And so we have to change the way we're running the city and run it more efficiently. But number one, I believe in every agency, we have somewhere between the area of a five to 10 percent a cut that we can do in, in, in budget to run a more efficient, more streamlined government. We could use attrition to save uh, money as well. Bloomberg did an excellent job in doing that as mayor. Uh, we have really bolstered the employee numbers in, our, in the city of New York over the last few years. And then we have to run a more efficient government around overtime. If you just look at the police department, uh, there's no reason uh, police officers are still going down to courtrooms, sending summon courts all day. Uh, the, the assignments, officers should be assigned more to work on weekends where you have a higher number of crime. If we smartly move our personnel around and become more efficient in how we run our city agencies, I believe you can save billions of dollars and by doing so, you can save money in overtime costs. Uh, we need to run our city more efficiently. What we should be asking of New York City is the same thing that we ask of every homeowner. Spend the money you take in. Let's stop spending money that we don't have. But where where is there an easy cut, though? So, for instance, let's take the police as an example. Crime seems to me through the roof. I'm not one saying this. It's in all the newspapers. We're having a, a, a crime spree every weekend. I see new 30 new shootings last weekend. Uh, what's going on? Because I don't even know, have they even fired any police yet? Like, why is this happening? I had a conversation this morning with the commissioner who I believe uh, is really a good police official. I need to be clear on that because uh, sometimes people believe when you critique a system that you love, that you are uh, criticizing the people who are running it. And that's not how I feel about this commissioner. I think he has a good heart. He wants to see the city safe. We may disagree philosophically on certain areas, but we don't disagree on the city must be safe. Public safety is a prerequisite to prosperity. So I think that we're seeing a number of things. Number one, I think it was a big mistake to dismantle the plainclothes unit. Policing must be unpredictable and predictable. Mm. The blue and white cars are the, the predictable aspect of policing. Unpredictable are the plainclothes officers. They are known for taking guns off the street. We need to reintroduce the plainclothes in a more modified, modern way. Second, we need to go after those officers. Many police officers who are doing the right thing have called me and said, Borough President, some of our colleagues are upset with politicians, so they're no longer responding to jobs the way they're supposed to. We are angry about that. The police department must go in and ensure that no officer out of his anger of policies or laws decided they're not going to protect the public. I've been disappointed as a former police officer as some laws that were passed. But James, there was never a day that I didn't put on that uniform and go out and protect protect the people I swore, I swore to protect. Uh, the second is uh, we need to be clear on dealing with this 
uh, overproliferation of handguns in our country, in our city. Uh, we have far too many, and our national leaders and statewide leaders must play an active role. The readily availability of guns is a serious problem in the city. And lastly, James, we got to deal with the large number of young men between ages of 18 and 24 who are unemployed, not in school, are not participating in society at all. We need to have a real plan to get these young people back into mainstream society so they don't see that crime is the only way to go. You know, a lot of that is, like you say, uh, you know, it's historically always the case for thousands of years that young men ages 18 to 24 are the most violent people in society. I think that's the real reason college was created. That's the reason the crusades happen is just send them away and, and let them come back later. And part of it now is because they don't have jobs because of these lockdowns, 20% unemployment in New York City. And again, I, I don't know about the medical aspects that's, that's above my pay grade, but lockdowns are bad for an economy. That's what we know. And that creates violence and unrest. So, no, so true, so true. And we need, a, I believe we need a real municipal bond program uh, to bring about a real employment. And why is that important now? Because let's be clear, uh, we were having major infrastructure issues long before COVID-19. We still have to show up our waterfronts. Uh, we still have to deal with our bridges and our tunnels. If we put in place a major capital bond program that would focus on hiring and creating jobs, uh, I believe we can have a, a great opportunity at looking at some of the inner city youth, getting them gainfully employed so they can feel like they're part of society. What, what about suspending some blue collar licensing laws? So let's say there's a 19 year old girl has kids, uh, you know, husband, wherever, uh, and she's been cutting her friend's hair all her life, but needs to go to a cosmetology school for, for 10 months and then spend all this money, which she can't do and she can't afford, even though this is all trivial for her. You know, there's so many blue collar licensing laws and these are the exact, the, the exact people who need jobs are the ones most affected. Like the wealthy aren't affected by those laws. And it's, it's random what, what laws, what, what jobs have licenses. Well, we have to do it in the right way. And, and I agree with you. And, and those are some real creative ideas. And that's why I enjoy talking to you because you're always thinking differently. But you want to do it in a safe way because if someone knows how to cut hair, we still want to make sure that they do not use the wrong chemical uh, to uh, harm someone. Uh, we want to make sure that they're not doing something that could have an impact on someone. So there's a reason that licenses are in place. Uh, we can suspend uh, the cost of uh, taking the exam or the test, uh, but you do want to have minimum understanding, uh, understanding of when you're dealing with chemicals, when you're dealing with certain things. Now, if you want to give someone a license or suspend a license uh, just for hair braiding, uh, that's fine. If you want to do it just for hair cutting, uh, that's fine. But when it starts to deal with chemicals and other things that could be harmful to people. We need to have certain standards to make sure that people are safe. Yeah, I agree. It could be industry by industry. It just, you could potentially unleash another 100,000, 200,000 jobs or more. I don't even know the, the full numbers. And, and even if it's a temporary solution or you have minimal requirements or a test or, or something. Um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of Oh, what do you think of this idea? And I don't know, this might be a crazy idea, but- Nothing is crazy during these crazy times. So, the, you know, there's, I think New York City owns about 27 hospitals that have around 7 billion in revenues. There are companies that know how to run hospitals efficiently and, and effectively and, and are good healthcare providers. What about the idea of, for instance, selling the hospitals? Like we're a city, we're not a hospital company. And, but that could maybe raise like $30 billion. Uh, and, and I like that concept of, 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 you know, let's do what we're good at and understand the things that we're not good at. That's so important. And our hospital systems are extremely complicated. Uh, you have uh, the private hospitals and the city hospital. All of them are nonprofit, but 
we use the term for simplistic reasons to say private and non-private. Uh, but clearly, uh, selling of hospitals is not popular uh, because you, you never want to get in a place that people won't have full access to health care um, when they need it. Uh, what we need to do is shore up our hospitals, uh, particularly the safety net hospitals. These are the hospitals that deal with Medicare patients, a large number of Medicare patients. Right now, we treat those hospitals unfairly. You know, you should not, uh, your ability to live or die during COVID-19 was clearly based on your zip code. Uh, that is the wrong way to run a healthcare system. I think we need to put more emphasis on uh, shoring up our safety net hospitals, and we need to move our medical system to pre preventive care. That's something I talk about in a new book that I produce, uh, Healthy at Last. That was a great int introduction to that. I really <laughs> encourage people to grab the book, Healthy at Last, and look at how do you really reverse uh, diseases. Our healthcare system, James, is not sustainable. We have we spend it, we're spending 80 cents on a dollar on healthcare, chronic diseases. 30 million Americans are diabetic, 84 million are pre-diabetic. Uh, you know, heart disease, which is preventable and reversible, is the number one killer for Americans. We can live a more healthy lifestyle, and that is what we need to do with our healthcare system. I agree. And and trust me, Eric, I am gonna mention your book on every single podcast <laughs> I do the week it comes out. What's the what's the day it's coming out? Uh, it's coming out in October, but you know one can pre-order the book if they desire uh, through Barnes and Noble or some some of the other online platforms. Or you can walk into the Barnes and Noble shop and buy locally. You know, uh, Healthy at Last is an amazing it's my life story, as well as how do you take a holistic approach to living a healthy lifestyle. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James daily fantasy sports made easy.
the future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. This is a, related to a specific area, uh, and I know there's a lot of questions about this, which is on the Upper West Side where a lot of families live, there's just no judgment either way. There's a situation where a lot of people who are uh, involved with, you know, health, uh, homeless shelters and other uh, places around the city have all been moved into two hotels or three hotels in the Upper West Side, and crime has spiked in that area, that, and that area is in, experiencing probably the most flight of any area. And that's the, that's the area where there's the tax base. I'm just curious, like, what would you tell those people? There's, there's 13,000 people in, in the Upper West Siders for Safe Streets Facebook group, and they're like panicking. And, and they should panic. They should be concerned. And I don't share the opinion of uh, that this is the privilege of saying uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. I don't share that. And I don't believe that. I think, uh, the voices you're hearing up there are parents who are concerned about their children and their families. Uh, and I believe they should be legitimately uh, concerned about that. I'm concerned what, when I see what happened down on Willoughby Street in Brooklyn. Hundreds of homeless people were moved in. Uh, the entire street has changed. All the work we've done uh, to improve that street, to bring about a level of normality and DCC has been destroyed overnight. And so I think there's a legitimate uh, outcry. This was poorly handled uh, by City Hall with no communication, uh, not really engaging the community, not giving people real services. You cannot drop into a community people who are uh, drug users, uh, dealing with mental health illnesses and other crises and now you put them in a community and disrupt the entire community. It could have been done better. Uh, we're seeing the same thing in Brooklyn. You don't try to solve a problem by 
creating three more problems. Uh, that's a problem. I, I agree, Eric. And that's why this all pains me so much. Like, and I know it pains you. It pains so many people that there, that these problems exist. And like, you know, you obviously saw my article about New York City. I wrote that on August 13th. And I feel like all the problems have doubled since then. Like a lot of these problems we're even talking about now didn't even exist when I wrote the article. And what would you do right now, for instance, to, to reverse this, this homeless problem where they're being just moved around arbitrarily, there's no services to help them. You know, the police are staying home. The garbage is all over the streets. Uh, you know, de Blasio is talking about raising taxes. So that's making more people leave because as, as charitable as people want to be, they just don't want to pay more taxes. What do you do? Well, I, I, and I don't, I don't believe or subscribe to the belief that people don't want to pay more taxes. Those who are of doing 10 million more a year, making 10 million more a year, not that they have 2 million more a year, uh, I believe what high income earners are saying, we don't want to continue to see our dollars wasted. That is what's frustrating people. If we had a quality education system that came from our tax base, I believe you'll see a different conversation with people. If we saw clean streets, not homelessness everywhere, we, if we saw crime manageable, people don't mind paying for their services. What they do mind is to give their tax dollars and watch a city poorly handle the dollars that go that that go into the city's coffers. That's where I believe we're seeing a lot of the anger and frustration. And so we have a city that's not being managed uh, correctly on so many different levels. We're still running an antiquated city in a artificial intelligence age. That is what we must change our thinking. And so I say this, James, even prior to coronavirus, we were not getting it right. Let's not kid ourselves. We were still having a substantial number of people that had a failing hospital system. We were still having a substantial number of children, predominantly black and brown, that were level ones and twos in education. We were having a, cr a criminal justice problem in certain communities. We, have, we had people who were living in poverty year after year, generation after generation, a failing NYCHA system, public housing. So we were, doing, we were not doing it right prior to coronavirus. So here's an opportunity to cycle out of COVID-19 with a city that is run smarter and better. And I think we can do that. Well, and, and what do you think? I'm trying to figure out, like, what is the mayor's agenda that he's doing all of these things that seem to be stabbing a knife right into the heart of the city, whether it's the restaurants or Broadway, which feeds an entire ecosystem of hotels and tourism or Midtown with all the workers, you know, going remote and, and, and moving out of the city to, you know, the police situation. I don't know what's going on with the garbage collectors. Nobody's picking up the garbage anymore and they're all being set on fire every night. So it does scare a lot of people. And what could his agenda, what, what is he thinking in his head? That, that's a great question. And if I, if, as a person who has been in the city during high crime days, uh, during the time when graffiti was everywhere, uh, homelessness and despair, crack cocaine was destroying our communities. Uh, I don't want my son Jordan growing up in the city that I grew up in. And I'm going to do everything that I can possibly do not to have it go back to something that I put my life on the line ensuring that we could raise a city where healthy children and families will prosper. Uh, that is my agenda. I can't speak on behalf of him. Uh, I know we are made up of some of the smartest and some of the most dedicated New Yorkers. And I think that if we come together and not create a division between police and community, between affluent New Yorkers and poor New Yorkers, uh, between all of us, uh, we can save this city, and I'm excited about the possibilities. I'm not looking at the despair and talking about what we are against. I'm going to circle myself with people who are going to talk about what we stand for, and we stand for a city that we love. And so going along those lines, I feel like you can make an argument. Anybody in New York City can make an argument. This is the flagship city 
of the United States. And it, it's clearly the financial capital of the United States. It has been for a long time, maybe even the financial capital of the world. There is an argument to be made for uh, federal government involvement, for uh, bond raising and so on. Maybe even, I, I feel like somebody should be doing a better lobbying job in DC, maybe visit the Federal Reserve. Like maybe they could buy, you know, they're they're going out on the curve, as they say, and buying more than just treasury bills. Maybe they can buy and restructure New York City debt or even commercial real estate debt or or other, you know, debt that, that pays for the police officers just to kind of carry us through. Uh, and again, with the argument that New York City is important enough, it deserves some attention that other cities don't necessarily need. Well, it's, it's, it's surprising to me that you have a president that fully understands the value of this city to the entire country. Uh, New York can't go under. Uh, the entire country is tied to the prosperity of New York. And that's why when you talk about uh, how do we think differently around finance, we have been meeting with some of the smartest men and women in the business uh, to come up with ways of really looking at the economic challenges that we're facing and come up with a formidable plan and addressing it. And I believe that there's there are a number of things we're going to have to do that if we don't get the assistance on the federal level, we're going to have to look at a short-term borrowing with a plan. Uh, we're going to have to look at uh, cost savings. We're going to have to look at revenue generators. I think all of these things are on the table and if anyone tells you anything other than everything is on the table, then they're selling you something uh, that you should not buy. Right, like the MTA, they just said on Friday they needed a $12 billion bailout and they're losing $200 million a week. Now, obviously that, that $200 million a week will go down once people are out more and there's vaccine, whatever, but that's months and months away. Uh, $12 billion is a lot for just the transit authority and then de Blasio says he needs another $5 billion to keep these 22,000 people employed. It's starting to, to add up in terms of numbers. Like, what do you think is a even possible short-term solution if, fed, if the federal government doesn't come through? Well, that's number one. Number one, we do need uh, the federal government and both the transit authority, transit authority, authority, they already have the ability to borrow. It's built into of uh, their governance structure because they are authority. Uh, they, they, of course, there's a limit on how much they, they could borrow. But if we don't get a revenue from the federal government, we're going to have to do a combination combination in the transit system uh, that is going to include some form of borrowing, um, some form of cost savings, even in the transit authority as well. Uh, with the city, uh, I believe that any conversation of borrowing uh, should come with a real plan for the from the for the mayor. We cannot just give the mayor a blank check and say you can borrow whatever you want. I think for every dollar borrowed, there must be a dollar cost saving savings within our agencies. Because remember, when you talk about the city of New York, you're talking about agencies. That is the cost of running the city. Our agencies, one of the largest of funding that we do is the Department of Education. I find it hard to believe that while we're going through this, we are hiring uh, new people that are not teachers in the classroom. Uh, we don't need new consultants, new advisors right now. Um, our focus should be on the classroom and the technology that our children need if we have to do remote learning. So these are the smart decisions we must make to streamline government and become more efficient in this city. And, and how do you keep companies in the city, or at least new companies coming in. Like obviously in retrospect now, it would have been great to have Amazon's 20,000 extra employees here. Uh, uh, but what would you do now to get big companies to, to take, to, to move here? Well, let's not, let's not kid ourselves uh, that we're not having large companies that are still looking at the attractiveness of New York. I was just down at the Hudson Yard yesterday. Uh, you have uh, Facebook moving into the folly of, of a, a building uh, down, down in that area. Uh, you have other multi-deals that are being reshaped and made. Uh, we need to go and create a business-friendly environment. I think in the last few years, we've done just the opposite. We've become anti-business. This was a place where it was called the Empire State. I think, unfortunately, 
we become a place where we destroyed empires. We need to turn that around and show that this is going to be an attractive place for business. We need to move the layers of bureaucracy. It is too expensive to do business in this city. And we have too many agencies in this city that instead of saying, we're going to ensure you stay in business, they're doing just the, the opposite. They're doing everything to prevent you from keeping your doors open. The uncertainty of doing business in the city is too costly, and we need to stop that. Right, because let's say these restaurants go out of business. Who's going to be excited about opening up the next wave of restaurants or investing in the next wave of Broadway shows if there's always a fear that this could happen to me too? That that would be a problem. But you know, you're running for mayor. You're 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 doing really well. You're very you're very extremely popular. Uh, but you're not going to be mayor for a while, even you know, assuming best case, let's say you win, it's it's a long time away that mayors change. What do you think, if you were to make a prediction, realistically, what do you think will happen? Well, for, first of all, we're still in our exploratory stage of the mayor's race. We still um, focus on what we need to do to get the city back up and operating, particularly here in the borough of Brooklyn. Uh, but I believe that we're going to go through some difficult times. The first quarter of the income tax in 2021, that first quarter, the numbers are going to be extremely lower than I believe uh, we think. Uh, many people have, yes. have been out of the city for over six months. I believe we're going to have a real issue. Uh, I believe when you look at those tax receipts, uh, we're going to have to make some hard decisions. I think we've underestimated uh, even this budget. Uh, there's a real um, possibility that uh, the Financial Control Board is going to look at this budget to determine are we out of whack of $100 million, which would uh, start the process of a, of a potential takeover. Uh, but no matter how you look at it, we're going to need the help from the federal government because even the state is facing a multi-billion dollar budget deficit uh, as well. Uh, we're going to have to make tough decisions. And I think New Yorkers uh, could make those decisions. Remember, I was here in September 11th, Jane. And uh, we had the wind knocked out of us uh, during that time. But you know what? If we like it, if people don't realize it, uh, September 12th, something amazing happened. We got up. Retailers open, teachers taught, builders built. We continue to survive as a city. And I know this city, if I can borrow from the Snapple commercial, this city is great because we're made up of the best stuff on earth. We're New Yorkers. Well, I love it. And look, I hope you didn't get too upset about my article because I got a lot of grief for that. But I have good intentions, which is that I wanted to have discussions like this and I didn't think anyone was taking these problems seriously. Everyone seemed to just say grit and there's a maybe a $50 billion shortfall right now. <laughs> no, I, was, I would never get upset with your articles. I think that what's unique and amazing about you is that you encourage conversation and dialogue. And you know, growth is in discomfort. Uh, if you are in a comfortable place, you are not growing. And I think your article forced us to take a look at ourselves and start to really ask the question, you know, where are we going from here? And I look forward to more writings from you. You know, you're one of, you are my, one of my favorite comedians, one of my favorite deep thinkers, and one of my favorite people. Well, thanks, Eric. And I could say the same about you. And look, I, a lot, last podcast or two podcasts ago, we talked about a lot of your background and what led the events that led to Healthy at Last. I'd be more than happy to talk to you again in October. And we could even, you know, do part two of this conversation as well. But Healthy at Last is a plant-based approach to preventing and reversing diabetes and other chronic illnesses by you, Eric Adams. Uh, it's being released October 13th. And I know last time you told me the very riveting story of how you fought back diabetes and, and conquered it through healthy eating and a plant-based diet. It's, it was a very inspirational story and I really look forward to seeing the, the book out there and, and some of those ideas hitting New York City big time, assuming New York City you know, thrives again. And 
Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to insist you come on again so we could have part two of this conversation because I know when this comes out, everyone's going to say to me, and you know how it is, everyone's going to say to me, why didn't you ask this question? What are you? <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to, will you, will you agree to talk again at some point? Yes, anytime. It's always good hearing from you, seeing you, and talking to you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Eric Adams, th- I know you're busy. Thank you so much for joining the James Altucher Show, and I will talk to you soon and hopefully see you in person soon. Yes, love it. Take care, James. Thanks, Eric. Bye. At FedEx Office, we're here with the holiday cheer and expertise to help get your small businesses to do list done. Let us help you slay the holidays with the products, services, tools, and timelines that will make your business bright. Create more happy for the holidays at office.fedex.com.